Welcome to the Soul Fan Podcast with Diana and Lexi. On this week's episode, William Kiesel is our guest. William is the publishing director of Ouroboros Press, and his accomplishments are so thick, I actually have to read this. Uh, an antiquarian bookseller and faculty at 22 Teachings School of Hermetic Science and Magical Arts here in Los Angeles, one of the leading schools, mystery schools in Los Angeles, where he teaches. You tell me, William, a chemical and ceremonial magic, and you have decades of experience in hermetic, Kabbalah magic, and esoteric symbol systems. William assists seekers on the path to self-knowledge, which is what we are all about, in understanding the mysteries of the ageless wisdom. Welcome, William. I hope that we can roll out the red carpet for you because your accomplishments are so vast. Thanks for having me, you guys. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. This is um, William. You are my teacher and my grand teacher, right? Which is what Naha calls you for many of us because Naha Amadi, who uh, was my first teacher in the Western mystery tradition, is actually a former student of yours, a current colleague at 22 Teachings. And you've, you've even uh, published a book together or she wrote an intro for an English translation of a tarot book. Yeah, the Mont Primitif uh, was originally a French encyclopedia uh, from the 18th century, and it contained the very first essays on the tarot as being used as a divinatory tool. And if you read any uh, history books about the tarot, that, that those texts are mentioned, uh, but there wasn't an English translation of that. Uh, so we arranged to have that translated, and Naha wrote the introduction. And so I co-published that with the school. And yeah, just really happy to have that out in the world, finally, for English-speaking readers. Yeah, and sorry to spring that question on you. I wanted to add it, but then I also wanted to find my signed copy of the book, which is signed by you and Naha, obviously not the original, original author from 500 years ago. But I was going to ask what it is you do at Ouroboros Press, because I've bought some rare and uh, used books from you before that are pretty exciting. And so I brought a couple of them. Let's see. The first is this beautiful Thought Forms book by Annie Besant. And then this has become one of my most prized possessions ever. Okay. This is what is it? F. Marion Crawford. Hard to see it. It's Zoroaster. It's F. Marion. Oh, you, yeah, you bought that book on Zoroaster. Mm -hmm. It's hard to come by uh, books on Zoroastrianism. So but yet you have yeah. them. Well, I yes, the I've been an antiquarian bookseller as well as a publisher. So I've been publishing for twenty two years, and I focus on. Uh, Western esoteric material, primarily source texts, so books that are referred to when you're reading the history of, of alchemy or the history of hermeticism. These are books that come up when you're reading the history. And they were, I got into it because I was researching and these books were unavailable. So I started do, doing uh, research in uh, archives and libraries and different uh, institutions and pulling these out of the out of uh, obscurity, but I've also been an antiquarian bookseller for over 30 years. So I've worked in used books and antiquarian books and specialize in es the esoteric field as well. So, uh, those two examples that you showed were books that I sold in that capacity. I didn't publish either of those. I try to, m through the publishing, make books available uh, that I've either had translated or uh, you know, just uh, reprinted. But then also, I always keep my eye out for important uh, esoteric material that's out of print or hard to find, or even new books like that. Uh, that's a new edition of the thought forms that you showed there. And 
they did such a great job. I think Sacred Bones published that. Uh, they did such a great job of reprinting that that I thought it would be a great one to stock. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really am a book person. Always have been, and I like to get those materials to people and help people find what they're looking for. Because a lot of times, there's so many different ways you can approach the esoteric world, and it can be overwhelming. I've had the pleasure working in the book field for so long of kind of knowing the the playground, if you will. And so I can kind of help direct people to what it is that they're looking for, or at least give them, a, you know, some hints, uh, because it's always going to fall upon the individual uh, to discover what path is right for them. So you're always a book person. So being in this line of work, it was it wasn't a huge surprise for you to find yourself here. Yeah, I. I've always been a book person. My family were readers and I found out about being able to trade books at used bookstores quite young. And when I was old enough to go to bookstores on my own, you know, as a teenager, I had a lot of books that had been handed down to me through my family. Uh, and so I took them around to all the different bookstores and got trade credit. So I was able to start collecting esoteric books when I was a teenager. And by the time I, I got out of high school, I already had quite a nice esoteric research library. Was there a, a book or author that initially sort of pulled you into the esoteric world? Was there one book that was like crackling with energy that you picked up and you opened it and you know the heaven shone down and kind of thing well i i was really just fascinated by books in general i mean a really early influence uh would be manly palmer hall his earlier publications were also beautifully produced manly hall not only published in a very wide variety of esoteric subjects he was very accessible in terms of uh, communicating those things to new readers, new new seekers. But he also made really beautiful books. He he was a book collector himself, and so when he started producing books, he would make them uh, be beautiful objects. And so I, I can show you one that is an early one of an early influence. This is an early Manly Palmer Hall book. It's called Codex Rose Crucis, and it's a Rosicrucian manuscript that he reproduces and then also has translated. There's the original manuscript is is in red, and then the black is translated. So, but you can see this is quite a quite a nice tome, and this was before he had the Philosophical Research Society. So this one was published nineteen under the imprint of the Philosopher's Press. Manly was really kind of an early influence for me in that regard. Is this the group that's located in Ojai, Lexi? They're, I think they're on Los Feliz here in LA, right? The oh, Philosophical okay. Research Society. Yeah, I've been, I've seen some of Manly's book collection, whatever is available to the public. And it's it's pretty amazing. This This person did have an incredible book collection. It's definitely sort of uh, goals to aspire to. He wrote one of the most influential 20th century books on in the esoteric field in terms of like, people think of him as a popularizer for the occult because he wrote a, a huge book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And it breaks down all the different branches of the esoteric world, the Western esoteric world. So there's chapters on Freemasonry, there's chapters on theosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, Hermeticism, Druidism, all different subjects. Uh, it's a lavishly illustrated book referred to as an elephant folio because it's it's quite large. It's it's like 20 inches high. It's like 16 by 20 inches. Ashen just did a reprint of it last year, or maybe two years ago. That's just beautiful. There's a lot of information in that book, but it's by no means going to solve things for you or 
find the answer for you, um, even though it is a book for seekers with a lot of information that's maybe more accessible than it would have been. It's still a really dense read. And you start out and you get a couple pages in, you're like, oh, it all makes sense. Yes, I'm getting closer. And then a few more pages, you're like, what? what? You have that moment where your brain explodes and then you read down to the footnotes and then it's directing you to all of these other source materials. As you mentioned, and you're like, well, I've got to get my hands on the source materials and the ones before that and before that. And it just sort of see, it, it's incredible, but it's not, it's not an easy read necessarily. It's, it's dense and it covers a lot. But as somebody who is maybe, I don't know, four or five years into it, I am still very overwhelmed by the secret teaching of all ages. It's a big book. It's a big book. He, he's, uh, he's summarizing all the different branches of esotericism. It's not a bad book to investigate if you're new to these things and want to just get a sense of what each of the branches of occultism are about. Because, I mean, well, you, you can't really do it all right away, right? It takes time and so kind of having a sense of what direction you want to take, it's a, it's a good one for that. Was that your first book, the first occult book? No. What was my first book? I think my first book was uh, actually on witchcraft. And that was because when I was a, a young boy, my mother had a friend who was a witch. And we were visiting her her home and I was playing with her dog. And I, I noticed that she had some interesting looking books on her shelf. And so I was looking at her books and pulled one off on magical herbalism. And I remembered thinking to myself as I was reading it, and there were passages in there about how magic was real. And I, and I was having this thought as a young boy, I was like, magic is real? And right as I was having this thought, the woman saw what I was reading reading and she goes oh an interest so young the spirits must favor you mm. and this is a woman who changed my diapers you know it was a friend of the family so the impact of that statement was pretty intense on me and so then i was then i was fascinated and uh you know it was several years later before i was able to sort of really start delving into what the esoteric world was about uh, and I was really fortunate to run into a person who became my friend and mentor. And he really helped give me direction, you know, in investigating things and trying to figure out, well, what, what's your real interest in the esoteric world and how can you approach it? And so I was really fortunate in that way. Just because we've done a few interviews, Lexi, kind of in the witch world, mm -hmm. I would be curious what you both feel the definition or explanation of the occult is, because I feel like how the media or how it's generally portrayed may not be what the actual intention or understanding really is. William, take it away. Sure. Well, occult, it, it comes from the Latin occultum, which means hidden. And what we're referring to here, you've, you've heard me use the term esoteric. And I, I prefer the, the word esoteric because it's a little more general and it doesn't quite have that. The, the stigma that's been attached to the word occult because of, uh, you know, the media, the movies, dogmas, religious dogma and what have you. But when we're talking about hidden, it's, it's because we're not seeing it with our, with our outward eyes. And the word esoteric actually means inner, as opposed to exoteric, which is the surface of things. So what we're trying to do with, uh, with the hidden things is see beyond the surface and get to the esoteric or the inner meaning of things. So the inner meaning of life and the inner meaning of the mysteries of life. For me, occultism really is about... Uh, penetrating beyond the surface of things and trying to get at what the source to life is really about. It's fascinating. The books that you've shown are, they feel like magical mystery books that they sort of, as a kid used, and even now, I mean, there's part of me that's always a kid that's super curious about what those pages hold within them and what sort of mysteries and powers unfold from them. 
Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why books are so fascinating, right? Because when we're reading a book, we're kind of we kind of are going inside ourselves a little bit, right? We're we're receiving information from somewhere else and it's taking us outside of ourselves a little bit, but it at the same time we're observing it and that's affecting our perception which is how we experience reality, right? Through our perception. And the thing is, is that our perception can be affected by all kinds of things, right? We, we hear things on the news, our friends tell us things, our parents tell us things, we have experiences, and all these things affect our perception. But what a lot of people don't realize is that we're able to affect our perception ourselves. And that's part of what the occult is about, is being able to be the ones that affect our perception as opposed to letting outside forces affect our perception. Language, writing and language is one of the most firm ways that we do that because language is how we direct just words letters and words are forms and that's how we articulate our thoughts our feelings and so when we use these forms these shapes they mold our consciousness into these concepts and that's how language works love that it's very can they, um yeah i was just gonna say can it, they help us those of us with busy minds the symbols and thought forms can that help us overwrite some of the noise and maybe unhealthy patterns that we may have come into the world with or how how does it work internally with with the symbols because with the esoteric books it's not only language but there are symbols and sigils and things that are uh visual usually not all the time and they're accessing parts of you that I don't know. I, from what I understand, that logical, busy brain, that chattery brain is sort of being bypassed there. So in addition to books in general, having the pow that power over us with the forms of the words and the, the language and the letters, the additional layer in the esoteric world is the, what is it, the symbols and the sigils. It's true. It's true. Sim symbols are really uh, the thing that drew me into es the esoteric world. I love the, mi the mysterious aspect that these sorts of studies imply with those symbols. And it's just important for us to remember that, again, uh, even in the case of symbols or images, uh, these are just a type of language. They're tools. Symbols the alphabet is a set of symbols. Letters are symbols. It's just we've been, we use them so often that we take it for granted. Uh, we speak all the time. Sometimes we don't even think about what it is that we're saying. Sometimes we don't even realize when we're reading things what we're reading, but it's still directing our consciousness because symbols are forms, they're shapes. And these shapes, it doesn't even matter if we understand fully because shapes have particular boundaries, right? A circle only has round sides. It doesn't have sharp edges like a triangle might. Triangles have points. So you can't really roll a triangle. The shape doesn't allow that. And the same is true with our letters. We, the different letters have sounds. They have shapes and they direct our consciousness so that we can get their bridges of understanding. They allow us the opportunity to communicate and symbols are the same way. And a, a lot of us today uh, sort of have an, a little easier time understanding this because of Carl Jung, who talked about archetypes, right? Everybody sort of understands what our archetypal imagery is. And it's, it's really true for symbols as well. Color, for example, you know, uh, colors are things. They don't represent things. Red is a warm color because it is a warm color. It, it doesn't represent warmth. Blue is a cool color because it, it has a cooling quality to it. We see the same thing in music. 
or the tones of our voice when we speak. Those tones, those vibrations affect us and communicate to us in invisible ways because of the shapes, because of the symbols, because of the, the forms these, kind, these ways of communication take on. And books do that in the most literal way, but everything that we perceive happens through that kind of interaction. We see a form or we experience a form, maybe it's an audio or a, a, a scent, and those things affect us because of the timber or the, the shade uh, that we're experiencing or the loudness or the bass. You know, high-pitched sounds compared to low bass sounds affect us differently. And there, it, It's not because we've, we, uh, we can project meaning onto that. And we do. That's where uh, what Lexi was talking about, how do we know when we're reading these things that, you know, that they're affecting us or how can we use these things to affect our consciousness, right? That's where conditioning comes into play. That's where dogma comes into play. That's where propaganda comes into play. That's where education comes into play. And so from my perspective as a, as a teacher of the esoteric world, it's really about helping people understand how perception works and that these symbols are tools that we can use. And I say this a lot to, to the students, you know, use the tools, don't be the tool. You want to understand how to use these things, not be used by them. And we, we see people being used by propaganda all the time. We see people... Uh, be conditioned. We, we're all conditioned in different ways. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different influences. But the more that we can be aware of these influences and understand how they affect us and understand how our perception works, the more we can respond to the, to the information we're receiving as opposed to reacting to it. I have a follow-up question to that, William, since you know so much about sigils and symbols and all of these things. Does a sigil or symbol have power over us if we don't know what it means or if we haven't drawn it ourselves? For instance, when I was new to this path, I was very proud and very outwardly sort of Wiccan looking. And so I went on Amazon to buy some really cool Wiccan sweatshirts to just let everyone know right away. And one of them, I was like, that one has cool symbols on it. After I'd hung in my closet for about a week, I was just like, you know, I don't, I'm not liking, I'm not liking the vibe here. I don't know why I feel like a poser. I, I should, probably shouldn't wear that if I don't know what those things mean. Fast forward to some kind of group magical working. We're doing a 22 teachings and somebody in some book included the demonic sigils instead of the angelic sigils and I was like that's what was on my sweatshirt okay okay I got rid of it but would it have harmed me if I didn't know any better I guess I just wonder about that there well here's here's the thing first of all I'm one of these people that is I, I don't think it's helpful to be superstitious but that doesn't mean that things can't uh, affect us because as I said, forms have shapes and these shapes direct our consciousness and you don't necessarily have to understand what something is in order for those, for those shapes to take effect. But at the same, by that same token, we have to remember that these are just tools. I mean, when we think about it in terms of language there's words that exist that we understand or maybe don't understand, but they, we don't have to let them affect us, although sometimes they do affect us. Um, and so it really, again, comes into personal responsibility of understanding how is how am I being affected by what I'm perceiving in the world around me. Now, when you have information, that maybe this shirt that I have has a demonic sigil on it and you got that information. Now you're confronted with some more questions. What, what is a demon? 
<laughs> and what does it mean that I'm wearing it on a shirt, right? So now you've got more questions. And what I find is, especially with the demonic uh, material, uh, is a lot of times, I mean, the reason, part of the reason why that material is even made available on t-shirts is goes back to what Diana was talking about is this idea that's projected onto occultism, right? We have movies, we've got, we've got novels that kind of portray occultism as like the spooky voodoo, you know, or you can get power if you, if you use these things. And so people uh, fall prey to that idea because again, that's what they've been taught by watching movies or reading books uh, including authentic books, because there's books of magic that offer these these things as well, right? But the thing to recall and to remember is, is that these things are created by humans. And humans have all different kinds of uh, reasons for what they do, not always on the up and up. Which is why I think, especially if one is on the, the uh, path of seeking uh, wisdom, that it's important to understand yourself and understand how you operate, how you work, what your operating system is, how your consciousness works. Because do you want somebody else directing you? Do you want somebody else telling you what to think, what to feel, how to act? Uh, we can give some examples, right? Like witchcraft, for instance, was... Uh, still is persecuted, but it was really persecuted in the past, primarily by uh, religious movements, not just Christianity, but a lot of the monotheistic religions are anti-witchcraft, anti-sorcery. You know, uh, in the West, in the church, they didn't want people reading the Bible. They didn't want people reading the words of her of heretics who they consider to be her heretical because when you're reading these words, your consciousness is conforming to those shapes. You are literally having the, the thoughts of the heretics. That's why they wanted to burn books. That's why they wanted to burn heretics because they were afraid that people were going to start thinking like the heretics or afraid that they'd start thinking for themselves because let's be honest, a lot of the religions have controlled people through using their sacred texts and writings, interpretations of their sacred texts and writings to manipulate political movements. We see a lot of that in dogmatic examples of religion. So, and when I, I, I make a distinction between religion and spirituality, right? You can be spiritual without having to go to church. Uh, it's a it's a, a roundabout way bringing it back to your your question about the sigil can it affect you it can affect you in a number of different ways you can be totally ignorant of it and just think this is cool i want to i want to convey to other people i'm into the occult and so in that sense you're using it as a tool your intention is i want to tell people i'm interested in the occult so there's a there's a way that you're you're use, you're communicating right it's language again but because you're ignorant of what it was other people that might know what it is or even not know what it is and still be afraid of it because it's a sigil it, it doesn't even have to be demonic people project onto angelic sigils and think they're demonic so now you're in a situation where you're where you're wearing something that other people are having reactions to that are that you're encountering and maybe having to deal with that. So did the sigil do that? Well, yes, the shape of the sigil communicated to people. Did it communicate its true meaning? Well, again, that's another existential question, right? I, I brought that up earlier. What's a demon? Well, now what's truth? These are very difficult concepts to articulate, uh, and these are part of the reason why we study the occult. But whether we understand or don't understand, there are effects to 
the fact that we understand or don't understand that are beyond our control sometimes when we're interacting with other people. And the more that we understand ourselves and understand how our consciousness works, the less we become enslaved to symbols, the less we become enslaved to language, the less we become enslaved to superstition. All right. So innately, no, I don't think those things could harm you, but there's potential for effects to happen in the world. Just like uh, you could take the sigil out of it and just wear all black. Yesterday was International Goth Day, right? And some sure people was. think that people that wear all black are bad people. Because again, it's it's symbolic. It's it, We're projecting on things, ideas that we've been conditioned to believe. But in the occult path, it's important to get past the surface. We don't want to judge a book by its cover. We want to get deeper in and make our own determination, you know, and there's people like me that teach, but at the end of the day, we have to learn ourselves, you know, because I can tell you all kinds of things and it's no different than reading a book. It's no different than hearing it from a, a politician or a teacher or a, a guy on the street, you know, or a guru sitting in a cave on a mountaintop. I mean, this is information you're getting from outside of yourself. So the more you can understand your own consciousness, the easier it will be for you to navigate uh, any kind of situation that you're dealing with, whether it's an occult one or real life, which in my opinion isn't, there's no difference. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And if it was only one, one demonic sigil, maybe I would have taken the time to research. But there were like 25 on there. There was no way I was going to be able to really understand all of them. And um, yeah, the reason I threw it out is I felt like a huge poser. And I was a little afraid of, you know, summoning something by accident. Um, because as you said, we don't want to be superstitious. But sometimes things get a little weird. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, what was it? The ninth gate. It's a, a movie about, and go, okay. So I think it's, who is it? It's Johnny Depp or somebody. And he's got a rare and occult bookshop and it's in the nineties or early two thousands. And somebody is, I don't know. There's a woman who's flying downstairs trying to get a book and something's evil and somebody's evil. Have you ever encountered a book project or a book? or a manuscript that maybe seemed a little cursed. <laughs> yes. Uh, the very first book I published had uh, a reputation for being a cursed book. Uh, it was a 10th century Arabic book of magic called the Picatrix. And <clears throat> I had, it, again, it was a book I wanted to read because it was mentioned in, in uh, a lot of, historical text that I was reading. And, you know, I've, I've done a lot of uh, reading in, in the history of the occult world. And part of the reason why I was reading the histories was because of my involvement in the occult world. And I wanted to know the origins. I wanted to know, understand where, where do these ideas come from? How did these ideas develop? And I think it's really important to understand where ideas come from both historically speaking, but also our own thoughts. It's, it's the same thing. Going back to the source, where do our impulses come from? And so I had heard about this book, and I was at the time apprenticing as a bookbinder, and I was already doing research in libraries uh, and pulling this kind of rare material out and uh, so my my bookbinder teacher was asking, he'd always say, well, when are you going to publish a book? <laughs> and I wasn't really ready. I was, you know, I was 18, 19. And I just kept saying, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And he's like, well, you're pulling all these manuscripts out of the libraries and the museums. I mean, you, you're you ready, you know. Um, and so one day he he would always ask me and one day he finally asked and I said, well, I'd, if I was going to do it, I would do the Picatrix. And he said, well, did you know I have an Arabic copy 
and the Arabic's the earliest version. So I set out to translate that book. And when I started to embark upon that journey, I had a lot to learn because I didn't really, I, I had never published before, never worked with translators before. So a lot to learn. I learned from uh, people, when people would hear I was working on it, they would say, aren't you afraid of the curse? And I, I just, you know, I heard that from a couple of people in Seattle where I, where I lived and I kind of took it with a grain of salt, you know, because people are always talking about, <laughs> talking about stuff. And particularly one, one of my elders was one of the ones that said this to me and, but he also likes to tell stories and embellish stories, usually with a, some kind of, a, you know, uh, a point to his stories. So I took it with a big grain of salt, but the more I worked on it, the more I would encounter strangers who I didn't know from other cities that would ask me the same thing. And I had never heard that there was a curse on this book, but I was starting to hear it, hear it over and over and over again. And uh, when people say, well, aren't you worried about the curse? Uh, my response would be, no, I'm, I don't worry about curses. You know, because I'm not a superstitious person. I don't worry that I'm going to break my mother's back by stepping on a crack. That doesn't mean that there aren't dark forces in the world. That doesn't mean that there aren't dangerous things that can happen to us. Uh, you know, intentions uh, can, can be very palpable. We've all experience that time where we walk into a room where maybe there was an argument before and, and we, we weren't there for the argument, but we can feel the tension in the air. And that book Thought Forms really gets into that, right? This this idea that there that there's sort of a numinousness to consciousness, this this an astral or etheric atmosphere around thoughts, around intentions. And we can feel it from people when people smile at us on the street or, you know, give us a wink or uh, whatever. There, there's, there's subtle ways that we experience these things. In the case of the curse, uh, I took it to be more of a folk tale. I took it to be more of a, of a, uh, just a warning. And here's the thing. Bear... Where does this idea of this book being cursed come from? You know, it's not in the book itself. It doesn't say in this book, in the book, if you read this book, you're cursed. So somebody else made the idea that this book was cursed. And very likely it was a religious person that was afraid because it was an occult book. And they were like, oh, don't don't get involved with that. You'll get cursed. You know, um, this whole idea of cursing and hexing again, it's, it's been popularized by the media and by movies. And that again, it's not to say that people don't do it. They do, but I find it to be very, uh, immature. I think that, uh, you know, when you're on a spiritual path, the idea of cursing or hexing somebody is, you're kind of off on the wrong foot there, in my opinion. You know, yoga, the, the word yoga literally means union. So we're trying to become whole. We're trying to, be, to become unified. And as a society, I think that we need to be concentrating on concord and humanity instead of dividing ourselves in all these different ways. And curses and hexes are ways in which people try to scare people away from certain ideas. Don't go there. It's a bad idea. You know, it's good to be careful. It's good to be cautious. It's good to, to protect yourself. I mean, we, we, you know, put on a raincoat before we go into rainstorms. We, when we climb mountains, we use ropes and safety equipment. We put our seatbelts on when we get in the car. And you want to do the same mentally and emotionally when you're dealing with the world, because we don't know who we're dealing with out there. But we don't put our seatbelts on because we're superstitious that, that we're going to get in an accident. We're doing it because there's the potential for that. So, yeah, the, the cursed book thing. I had to raise my eyebrow once or twice, but uh, 
you know, I, I was just like, well, you know, this is one of the situations where as a magician, I'm going to show you that a curse isn't really going to be something I need to be worried about. I didn't find that there was anything valid about it just because it had that reputation. So talking about uh, the perception of the occult and other matters related to that, um, do you feel like censorship is potentially strong at the moment for these kinds of publications or knowledge? Yeah, I think I think censorship is. Uh, I mean, it, it's this is nothing new, right? We mentioned it before. The church didn't want didn't want these kinds of things being read, and you know, I think a lot of that stems from fear and the desire for control over people. Um, fear for things they don't understand, and that that idea of control because they want to they want to control people and they and it manipulate what people think and feel. But, you know, there, there's another issue related to this. And, you know, I think, I think we were, you know, through email kind of talking about it through some of the questions you asked, uh, expressing ideas in this environment of censorship, right? This idea of what, what do I think about communicating, especially about the esoteric world or the occult world. And, and my feeling is we're, we're very fortunate that we're able to do that right now, but I'm not sure it's necessarily the best thing to stand on a soapbox and, and uh, shout it out with a megaphone. And the reason is, even though these subjects are very popular right now, witchcraft, tarot, divination, all these things, they're all very popular and rising in popularity they are still heretical in the eyes of orthodoxy, and they always will be. And to think that, that that's going to change anytime soon is, I think, a little short-sighted. The popularity feels like everybody's doing it. You know, it's like Harry Potter came out before that Da Vinci Code. They're, again, like movies and novels popularize things, but they don't necessarily bring understanding. And since the understanding isn't there, you're dealing with ignorance, and ignorance carries along with it fear. And so you can put yourself in danger by being a megaphone, uh, and I think there's a time and a place to communicate these ideas, but I feel that it's important personally my style, I, I, I can't get away from it because I'm a cult publisher. So I'm, I'm already on the map. People already project onto me. When that movie that you mentioned, The Ninth Gate, based on a novel called Club Dumas, when that came out, people would come to me and they go, they made a movie about you because I'm an occult bookseller and so was Johnny Depp in the movie, even though <laughs> the character that Johnny Depp portrays I'm nothing like that. <laughs> so I was a little offended when people were saying Stop. they made a movie about you, you know, which just sort of underscores how easy it is for people to understand and and not under not get what the information that's being conveyed is about. And so we see a lot of politics being put in, being used by uh, the esoteric world and Sometimes this is good because, again, we're talking about symbol systems and they are types of, of languages. It's a, it's a way of communicating. Uh, you know, we see, like, like, for instance, witchcraft and feminism have really come together in this day and age. Pam Grossman's uh, podcast, The Witch Wave, I, and I think it's done a lot of positive things in that regard. Or like the Satanic Temple. They've done a lot of political work that is interesting and effective, utilizing these esoteric themes. But personally, I think that uh, for myself, even though I'm a public person and, and it's clear that, I, that I'm a magician and that I study these things, when I try to communicate with them, I try to communicate with people about them in a way that they can understand as a human being instead of like, well, I'm... 
I'm an initiate, an initiate of whatever degree. And you'll never understand because you haven't gone through these ceremonies and the, the, the clap trap, you know, the, the superstitious stuff that, that, uh, people tend to, you know, embellish themselves with. And I think that it's important for us to be able to communicate as human beings to anyone, uh, especially if it comes to helping them understand themselves and the universe better. And that's not to say that I want to pull the mysticism out of the occult world, because I love the mystery and the mysticism. But it, again, it's important to know that these are tools. They're, they shouldn't be uh, bonds. They shouldn't be chains that we're that we're locked into. And if we're using them to come into conflict with people, I don't think that's good. You know, like in the case of feminism and witchcraft, witchcraft and feminism are being used together to create harmony, harmonious experiences, as opposed to using witchcraft to like hex the patriarchy or whatever, which again, that can be useful in a certain context. But you you want to be careful because you don't know who you're dealing with out there. The only person that we have any control over is ourselves. And we can shout on the tops of the mountaintops what we think is right. But if, if the other people disagree or don't understand, we could be putting ourselves or others in danger. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for having me.